I'd signed up to do a, a master's at Smurfit and then I saw uh, an ad for a job which was for a business graduate position for an Irish supply chain startup in Shenzhen. And um, I had no idea where Shenzhen was, it was in China. Um, I didn't study any of my subjects in supply chain, I focused on other areas. But uh, something had stuck with me from a, a strategy lecture and it said, China, that's where there's going to be a massive transformation. It's the place that everyone should be looking at. And so when I saw this job ad, I was like, might as well give it a shot. It's a bit of interview experience, you know, see what, uh, see what comes out of it. Um, and then I got an opportunity to meet with the CEO, uh, Liam Casey. And he, uh, his interview style is interesting. He, uh, he was like, on his laptop, three phones going and asked me questions. I was like, okay, where do I even start? But uh, yeah, so, but two hours later, seeing a vision for a company and what they were looking to develop and uh, transform and everything that was happening in China, uh, four weeks later, I was on an airplane out to Shenzhen and uh, never looked back. Um, so I spent six years with PCH there uh, under learning about supply chain, which is important, um, and working with big clients like Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, through that entire iPod, iPhone, iPad uh, growth phenomenon, and uh, saw an entrepreneur in action um, and a visionary, which was amazing. Mm -hmm. and, and through that then, seeing China and it growing and booming in the economy, developing while I was there, it felt wrong. We were in export, everything we were doing, we were shipping out. So I wanted to do something that uh, really was more involved in the actual domestic market and what was happening there. So that's when I had my first dabble in my own entrepreneurship and um, set up an online wine business there and uh, went through a massive learning curve in doing that. <laughs> so, yeah. Let's go back to P PCH um, because I was just thinking, if I had the opportunity to work for Liam Casey straight out of college, has everyone heard of Liam Casey, by the way? So he is one of our most well-known um, Irish entrepreneurs, uh, very well-known for bringing hardware to life, so bringing products from concept to reality, um, and is also known as Mr. China because of his connections um, in China and then the neighbouring countries as well. So he is on my list of people I would love to work for. So I could just imagine, fresh out of college, you get this opportunity but at the time, PCH only employed about 40 people, right? So it was a leap of faith. And that's yep. something you talk about all the time. And I'm sure maybe you got kind of feedback from family and friends wondering what the hell were you doing? So how, how did you kind of come to that decision and decide, you know, yeah, let's go for it. I'll, I'll try this and see what happens. Yeah, I think it's something that I've actually had to talk, think about a bit more before my speech on, on my talk on Friday. But uh, um, I think... It, it's something about that unknown and that opportunity and seeing you don't know what's going to happen but um, you know you've met the right people and you believe in the vision that they're going for so like I got the list of all the reasons why I should not go to China um, <laughs> like what? <laughs> well, yeah, you've, uh, you don't know the language you've never <laughs> been there it's not safe to cross the road like every kind of <laughs> preconception that you might have about China I got the list from the family. I got the phone call from the sister in Sydney going, are you sure about this? Like, obviously the, the family had rallied it again <laughs> around it. Um, but in my gut, I just knew that China was where things were happening. Uh, PCH was a company that was going somewhere. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, what was the worst that was gonna happen? I could always come home. Like, mm. it, I, and you know, you, you do certain things, I bought my Lonely Planet on China, so I figured out where Shenzhen was, mm -hmm. step one. Then, um, you know, I, uh, one of my mates had studied supply chain, it, uh, one had actually taken that module, so I got her course notes to kind of <laughs> figure out what this was all going to be about. And um, yeah, and just mitigated the risks that were there in the best way I could. And, uh, and went for it. Mm. And it was also before Shenzhen was sexy, right? So now it's kind of very well known. Um, it's very close to Hong Kong, so it's easy kind of for Westerners to, to live in Hong Kong and, and to get the boat to Shenzhen. Um, so, sorry, there's a little bit of an echo there. Um, so tell us about 
the initial kind of starting out of PCH because I read an article that, that you um, or an interview that you had done where you weren't really sure what your role was going to be but that actually really excited you and you just got stuck in and I think you started off as an account manager but then worked your way up um, at an amazing kind of speed and level across the years that you were there. Um, yeah everyone was asking me okay so you're going to go to China what are you actually going to be doing there? Mm -hmm. I was like I don't know. Um, <laughs> I'm a business graduate, I, I, I do whatever I get told, I guess, and um, yeah, and I, I got a great opportunity because, I, well, I'm pretty much willing to take on any challenge. So from starting in figuring out the processes, the company was starting to scale, and we knew we had to build in repeatability and scalability about what we were doing. So it was like, go and figure out what everybody is doing. Um, and document it so then we can figure out how we can build going forward. So it was the perfect way for me to like get a complete understanding of what's happening. Um, and then I get put on a project and I'm out of a factory and I'm like, okay, what am I even meant to do here? Um, and seeing how uh, intricate it was to like create the, the, even the simplest of pro products the steps that are taken in that manufacturing process and the appreciation for the detail that's required. Um, I got to then see that side of the business. Um, and I, but I, all through my career, I think I, like I've taken on a challenge and I've done as well as I can, but while doing it, then I look to see what is the next thing that's there. And so I, you know, I've done project management, I've done the operations side, uh, I, started then into the sales side, let's see how I can do with that. And, um, and then at one stage I got an opportunity where there was like, okay, you can either manage the account of our biggest client, or there's this really boring role, which is <laughs> business operations planning and like the projection of the business going forward. Um, but I'd done the project management, I'd done the account management, I had never done that oversight over the business, that strategic viewpoint of, and understanding what shareholders want to see and how we present the business to them. So I was like, look, it's a great opportunity to take that big account, but I'm going to go with the boring one. Um, and that then enabled me to work with CF, the CFO, the COO, the sales guy, and really get to see the entire business. Um, yeah, so I think it's been about always wanting the new challenge mm -hmm. rather than continuing to do the same thing over and over again. Mm. And then you were very involved with the launch of Highway 1 as well, which I'm um, not sure if you've heard of it, it's PCH's Accelerator um, and Innovation Programme. It's run out of San Francisco and Shenzhen, Shenzhen as well. Yeah. Um, and again, probably the most known hardware accelerator in the world. And obviously with hardware, a lot of accelerator programmes don't tend to touch that area because it's quite tricky. So tell us about kind of how that was launched at the beginning and your role in it, because it's super interesting. Um, yeah, so it was actually just after I'd had my own startup and um, I'd made the decision that the model that I had wasn't exactly what was gonna go forward and I needed to take a step back. And it was right at that time then that uh, Liam reached out to me and he was like, look, we want to help more startups. We've created a, a, a platform to enable Apple, Microsoft, all of those guys. Um, what if we were able to give that access to those suppliers and that supply chain to hardware startups trying, coming out the first time? We can de-risk what they want to do. We can help them distribute their product. And he was like, no one in the team here has actually had their own startup, but you have. So you actually get what the startups are going through and um, what, what they need. Um, so that's when I, I, I came back to PCH and uh, was part of the founding team that set up Highway 1. And it's one of those ones where it's like, okay, but we want to be launched by May, and it was March. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, uh, whirlwind trips to San Francisco, trying to understand how we wanted, what hardware startups were missing and how we could help them. Um, and so, uh, worked with a really great team, um, which we, we launched by the May, and we had our first cohort in in the September. And um, um, yeah, that was a great experience. And I think it's something that working with those hardware startups and helping them get their product to market. I guess you've all heard the cliche: hardware is hard, mm -hmm. and everyone thinks their their product's ready. 
and half the time they've been like treating their prototype like a little baby and only letting people touch it in a certain way, not the way a consumer is going to touch it. Um, we, we, we can make it definitely at scale and we're going to get our price down by you know, 50% once we go to scale, but they haven't figured out how they're actually going to make the product and the manufacturing process and the fact that they still need it to go through a whole design for manufacture, figure out their tooling, figure out all of this. So what we realized is like we needed to go back to complete basics on um, manufacturing 101 for a lot of these startups because they had their, um, their iOS developer and they had their design guy, but nobody had a supply chain guy. Nobody had an in someone who understood inventory management or anything like that. And uh, yeah, so we had to then build that infrastructure to be able to do it on a repeatable basis as well. Mm -hmm. So tell us about the fact that, so two different markets, so San Francisco, the Valley versus China, Asia, very, very different places to do business. What role did each of those kind of places um, play in Highway 1? Um, yeah, well, Silicon Valley, San Francisco played a key role in raising funds. So for hardware, you need to have the, the funding behind you to be able to get your product to market. And so um, in Shenzhen, you wouldn't have had the same access to capital. Even some of the hardware accelerators, um, like Hacks, they have a very big presence in Shenzhen and run a very good program, but they still do their demo days in the Valley and still showcase the products there because that was where there was the biggest appetite. Um, and also a lot of the design and a lot of the, um, the talent that the hardware startups needed to actually get their product to the place it needed to be was also there in the valley. So. Okay. And what's your opinion on, so just curious about you know, route to market and the role that crowdfunding companies have uh, with, with hardware products. What's your opinion on, on those? Okay. <laughs> I've seen a lot that has not worked well. Um, so the thing with crowdfunding, I, I feel anyway, mm -hmm. is that it's become more of a, a marketing tool to get the name out there about your product and to get your first few, few customers. Um, but the money that you get from that, you'll actually end up spending keeping those customers that you've promised a product to happy. You know, you'll end up having to hire a customer service person because every week you're getting that email, where's my product, where's my product? Um, and a lot of people have banked on that money they get from crowdfunding to finance their supply chain and the manufacture of their product and um, it backfired for it and continues to still do it for mm -hmm. like I'm still waiting on a pair of shoes I ordered on Kickstarter that they're yeah. still trying to find there but anyway but it's um, I still haven't learned but um, <laughs> yeah no it uh, yeah I see it's, it's definitely got a role to play but uh, startups need to be very aware of um, the exposure it gives you and typically you're not ready you're still working unless you've got your product ready to ship um, you're still you don't know what roadblocks you're going to come along and how long that time is going to be before you're ready so I would recommend people to use your crowdfunding site when you're nearly ready to ship and to then use that as your marketing money to get your product go out there mm -hmm. okay cool so You've spent a few years at PCH, you decide, hmm, maybe I'll go out and do my own thing. So tell us about your, your wine business and, and how that came about. Well, I love wine, so... <laughs> um, and well, we're living in, in Shenzhen at this time, uh, very different now, but uh, you couldn't get good wine. It, the, you, there was about four different labels of wine that were there in the supermarket and it was so frustrating. And the price point that they were being sold at was just crazy. They just, people, it, they had the market sewn up. Um, and so, and wine was something that we liked. And what we saw was the appetite for wine in the actual Chinese consumers was, was also skyrocketing. And in a supermarket, there would have originally been maybe one or two shelves of wine. Suddenly, nearly a third of the supermarket was being filled with awful wine. And so we were like, okay, there's definitely an opportunity there. Also, the e-commerce and online platforms in China was also going through a boom. I was living there in the economy and just 
feeling like if there's an opportunity, if we don't go after this, then it, I was going to regret it. Like I, I want to understand the Chinese consumer. I want to see how we how to sell to them, how to interact. Um, yes, so we went and we set up Crush Grapes, an online wine platform. And, uh, you know, everyone was like, oh, it's going to be so difficult to import that wine into China. You're going to have to set up a, a wafi, a wholly owned foreign enterprise, and it would be so complicated. That was the easy part. <laughs> that, you know, I, that you can follow a process and you can figure that out. Um, figuring out the Chinese consumer, on the other hand, was a whole different challenge. Um, and so I, I went to the stage of doing, I was Gary Vaynerchuk inspired, doing online wine videos in Chinese and <laughs> doing uh, wine dinners and, in, and doing wine presentations in Chinese and all this sort of stuff. And, you know, the business was fine. I was selling wine when I was engaging with consumers. It was always interesting to talk to the Guaylo about wine. And so it was fine. But what we wanted to build was that platform, that online platform that would take it to scale. And there was... And during that time, there was a number of big guys getting into that space as well. Um, yeah, and so one of the big learnings for me there as well was, okay, when do you decide to keep going or is it time to take a step back? And it was heart-wrenching. I was doing something I was passionate about and I, I loved um, engaging and, and getting to know all, all our Chinese consumers. but. It wasn't what we were looking to build, and so that was a very hard decision. But uh, I wouldn't change the learnings I got from it at all, and so yeah, chose to step away from that and open up massive opportunities for me as well. Mm. So, so when you say we, was that you and your husband? Uh, well, in theory, but it was just me. I'm just being. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my next question. So leaving PC, how many people were at PCH when you left? Uh, yeah, it was booming at that stage. Um, everyone was like, you're crazy. Why are you leaving right now? You've mm. been through the hard times. But anyway, um, um, oh, I, I, there was probably coming up on a thousand employees at that stage. So you go from a company with a thousand employees to working on your own. So that must have been quite lonely at the start. Did you, you know, how did you cope with suddenly kind of being on your own and so maybe feelings of isolation? So that was actually interesting as well because the startup scene in Shenzhen was actually just starting to kick off. And so I went to one of the first uh, startup meetups uh, in a, a little hacker space that, it, that uh, one of the guys I knew had put together. Um, so it was, uh, it was definitely lonely, but also again, community, communities like this and um, having a space to go to and talk about, okay, what are you doing on Weibo or what are you doing about with Tudo and all the different platforms um, and to bounce ideas off people. Um, uh, there, well, that was starting to build up there. Mm. But I definitely had very lonely moments as well. Yeah, I can imagine. And tell us about your market. So was your target consumer the Chinese consumer, the Western consumer, a bit of both? People like you who are finding it hard to, to find good wine? Uh, yeah, it was the up-and-coming Chinese uh, middle class along with your, your expat scene as well. Mm. So there was a big, especially for the up-and-coming uh, middle class, there was a lot of interest in education about wine and wanting to understand more about it. Um, and so that's why we did a lot of actual wine education sessions and stuff like that. Mm. Okay, and when we talk about China, obviously China is massive market. Um, and I, I did work in China, but in rural China, so outside of kind of the, the middle class uh, Chinese consumer in, in Shenzhen, there's so many different kind of consumer groups. Did you ever kind of go outside of, of Shenzhen and, and the big cities, or where did you focus your attention on? So I focused my attention on the market that we were in, so it was Shenzhen, Guangzhou, Dongguan, Pearl River Delta area. Um, obviously, we had sites set on other areas and, and went and visited other locations and talked to partners mm -hmm. in other places. But again, yeah, the building it that that region alone it has massive mm -hmm. yeah dollars. Mm -hmm. so. Were you ever tempted to approach Gary V and ask to be his Chinese partner? <laughs> Cross my mind. I may, I may have uh, tweeted him the odd time, kind of going, hey. Um, yeah, I did actually get to meet him when he was in Hong Kong the other week, got my photo with him, all happy. But, so did I as well. Uh, I ran after him and got a hug and was on his video. And yeah, um, probably one of the most, most embarrassing moments, actually. I've got a I really let myself yeah. go. <laughs> I was like, no one will spot me on that, but <laughs> yeah. friends did. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, okay, so we'll, we'll move on from, from wine. So you've already said you know, it was obviously a really, really difficult um, decision to kind of close the business. Um, I'm sure there are people in the room who've maybe tried something and, and um, it's a terrible world that failed and then moved on, pick yourself up and, and try again. So what happened then? Where was your kind of headspace or what was your next opportunity? So I actually, uh, I was a little bit cheeky. So just as, um, before I, I f finally closed up uh, Crush Grapes, I'd had, I'd caught up with Liam a few times and then um, he was, uh, when I was closing up last day at the office, um, I put up a, a photo on Foursquare knowing that he was a Foursquare uh, junkie. And so literally I was out for beers that night and an email came through going, are you free to catch up tomorrow? So um, I kind of set myself up for my next stage as I was finishing off my, uh, my Crush Grapes uh, experience. So uh, yeah, and that's when there was a, a number of things going on between e-commerce, Highway One, mm -hmm. a few other things. And uh, so that's how I transitioned back into PCH. Okay, and then you moved on from PCH to Meta and, and Nest. So tell us a little bit about how you kind of moved on from, from working in Shenzhen then to Hong Kong. Um, so, and again, this is a little bit cheeky, but um, <laughs> Um, yeah, so I, I actually, so Nest um, is a, a VC in Hong Kong, but it started as a bit of an angel fund, just doing some small investments. What they realized was that startups coming over to Asia um, needed help in those connections into a lot of the big corporates out there. Everything is so relationship based out in Asia, just expecting to land in and be able to knock on people's doors. They'll, they'll listen to you, but you just won't get as far as you can do once you get the right relationships and those right connections. Um, and so they started running corporate accelerators. And obviously, I had set up Highway One and was part of the PCH accelerator. So when they had IoT and hardware startups, they would then bring them up to Shenzhen and I would help show them around. And so I got connected in with them. Um, and then I helped mentor some of their startups and was on a panel with, it, with them. And I was like, this is, this is someone I'd like to work for, these guys. So they were focusing on Southeast Asia and completely different sectors. They were more FinTech, health tech, and smart cities. And um, I was ready for a change. And so then again, when um, I was like, OK, they're, they're who I want to work for. So they just opened Meta, which is a, an innovation community space, a neutral platform within a, an ecosystem where everybody can come together and look to collaborate. Um, and so they were having one of their first events. And so I decided to, to rock up to that and spotted one of the founders. Um, I mentioned to him that, you know, I'm, I'm interested in, in moving on and what's happening. Um, he was like, oh, we're expanding. Um, and so, um, yeah, from that, uh, set up a meeting with them and uh, then the opportunity came up to run, oversee all their corporate accelerators that they were running from Korea to Nairobi, um, which was a phenomenal experience, um, working with the likes of AgTech and World Bank or Bangkok Bank in Thailand and uh, Infinity Motors in, in Hong Kong. It was just in incredible. Um, and during that time, Meta was growing, we'd opened up Nairobi, and so then, again, I, I like a challenge, but then I'm ready to move on. So, um, and so then now I've recently just moved into a role with them to help take Meta uh, to a global scale and build our digital platform and really bring the global innovation community together on one platform. Mm -hmm. so. so when I was prepping for this, I looked up the definition of Meta, um, does anyone know what meta means? No. Do you? Did you see my tweet today? <laughs> what does it mean? M-E-T-T-A, not M-E-T-A. No, okay. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's a word in, in Sanskrit, I think, and it means 
um, amongst other things, a genuine interest in another person, which I thought was really, really lovely. And, and you talk a lot about community, bringing people together. It's exactly what we are passionate about at Grind and at Huckle Tree as well. So um, that just really spoke to me as soon as I, I read that. I'm also a yogi, so immediately I yeah, just, just think, wow, that's so beautiful. Um, and it's also so rare as well, you know, and, and in a city like Hong Kong, which is, you know, so, <coughs> You know, it has kind of its Asian influences, but it's very financially driven as well. So, you know, time is money um, and it's really nice to kind of see a company like Meta who are genuinely interested in, you know, bettering other people's lives and supporting startups. So I'd love to just get your insight on the community side of things and how you, you know, bring people together. Is there an element of curation or how do you ensure that the people in your space are going to benefit from, from being there? Um, yes, yeah, so and it's, it's something that we're constantly continuing to evolve in that, but one of the key things, especially for our, our, our clubhouses, is everyone goes through an interview. Um, and it, it's, we're not, it doesn't matter where you come from, what industry or what your level is within an organisation. What we're really focused on is that you are wanting to give back. So everyone within our community has to guarantee that they are willing to give up five hours a month to help other people. Wow. And so, and it, it creates an amazing environment. And um, so, and then how we actually build our content is through the community. Mm. So we nominate curators who, want, who are passionate about a topic and then we've enabled them through a number of events to then pull together the people in, from the community that are interested in it. And you know, we've had some really great groups come out of it. There's uh, the Circular Community, which um, focused initially on sustainability, but then there was a big element of the fashion and retail uh, arena that came in there, and obviously with fast fashion and everything that's happening today. So their focus, and they have their own groups now, and they have their own meetups is focusing on Hong Kong and how we can make the fashion industry a much more sustainable industry. Mm. Uh, a women in tech group came out of it. There's a load of different things, but our role is there to facilitate and to bring the people together. Mm. I really like the, the five hours um, idea. It's very practical, um, really, really like that. So tell us about um, how you work with corporates then, because obviously any startup, it's always what we struggle with, you know, the commercialization part and, and bringing a product to market. And there's no point in building a product or service if no one's going to pay for it. So, you know, running these corporate innovation programs are amazing because it gives you the, the chance to pilot something and to actually get kind of live feedback. So tell us a little bit about how those programs work. Is it yeah, super structured? Is it kind of tailored to the corporate or how does that work? Yeah, so what, we're very much founder first. So what we do is before we uh, run any kind of program, we actually spend a lot of time with the corporate and really want to understand what are they trying to achieve out of working with startups. And there's definitely some that are looking for some like innovation theater. Look here, look, these are some funky startups that I'm hanging out with. Mm. Um, look at me. And then there's ones who realize that they're behind and that they do need to change how they're operating today. And then there's some really great ones that we work with as well that are, that are visionary and really want to, are already doing a lot, but understand that they've got to keep on learning and keep on developing. And so once we understand the needs, then we're very careful about the type of startups that we then bring in to work with that corporate. So like we've run some programs where the corporates are like, yes, we want to actively integrate startups into our business in the next three to six months. And so we bring in startups that are ready to scale mm -hmm. and ready to take on that challenge. Um, and then other ones who want to explore opportunities, we then bring in earlier stage startups and also bring in multiple partners. So then you're not just banking on one partner to work with, but you also get a lot of uh, exposure to other people in the region as well. Um, so we're very conscious of anything that we run, that we, we set it up so that the startups have the best, like it's an opportunity cost of time for startups, right? There's yeah. millions of accelerators going on, and you know, some startups do accelerator hop, which 
isn't isn't ideal either. But it's it's that you you want to make sure that if they're going to spend time with you, there's going to be a benefit from it. Mm. Um, and so we do we're very detailed in our tracking, and we also spend a lot of time in that facilitation. So a lot of the time we can see the problem that the corporate's having. We can see the startup and what they can do, but the startup sometimes doesn't pitch themselves so well to the corporate mm -hmm. and at times the corporate just cannot connect the dots um, and so we actually then spend time in those meetings helping to bridge that gap between uh, the, the amazing technology that's there and the opportunity that's there mm -hmm. for the corporate and hoping to open up the light that mm -hmm. <laughs> there is an opportunity there. Yeah. So, so many questions on that. So are the startups competing with each other or, or are they uh, all kind of put through the same program and then the corporate selects who they want to work with after? So we, we typically don't have competing startups okay. on a program. We, we, we'd look then for them to be solving different uh, problems okay. or creating certain uh, uh, new opportunities for a business. Mm. So. Okay. And as you said there, there are quite a lot of accelerator programs out there and we're actually launching uh, our own in, in September as well. So I'd love to know how you differentiate yourself from other kind of options in the market. Um, well, number one, we're, we're equity free. So we bring in startups and see how they work with the corporate. And then after that, we'll then decide mm -hmm. if strategically everybody's happy, then we'll, we might agree on an investment. Um, so equity free. Also, we're really focused on that scale up area. Um, we uh, we want to create business opportunities and growth for the startups. So we are we're more in that later stage. Mm -hmm. um, and then we focus on Asia, Middle East, and Africa, and and startups that want to expand to those regions. And so we focus as well on if you're looking to go to Southeast Asia. Bangkok, how can you set up there? What are the best ways for you to be able to optimize whatever government things are happening there? Um, yeah. And do you get many companies who are based over in Europe or in the US, or does it tend to be Asian companies? Um, it, typically, a cohort is probably about 50 50, so 50% 50 from the Asia region and 50% global. Like our, our main focus, and we do a lot of time in our screening and due diligence is finding the best startups. Mm -hmm. So if they're from Sweden, like, we go after them. We, we know that they've got the solution that should work mm -hmm. and we'll actually go after them rather than the startups going mm -hmm. after us. And how do you find them? That's kind of the, That's, uh, the secret question. Secret. Okay, <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's, it's super hard sometimes um, because there's an awful lot of companies out there. So kind of, you know, taking the time to, to see who, who the future stars are and, and taking a bet as well, because you never know, right? Yeah. Um, so tell us then about, so your job is, you know, you're scaling um, Meta and, and, and Nest as well. Um, I think your role sounds so interesting and just chief growth officer, I'm sure a lot of people agree with me, just sounds like a really, really exciting role. Um, so tell us how you were, you've scaled already into Nairobi um, tell us a little bit about, about business in Kenya, because I'm sure lots of us aren't kind of familiar with, with how business um, runs there. Yeah, so we've purposely opened up in two very different markets. So Hong Kong, obviously, big financial district, um, a very uh, forward-thinking economy. Then also, but then Nairobi, uh, a much more of an emerging market, a different approach to entrepreneurship and startups. Um, and what, we've done that purposely because there's so much knowledge that can be shared from both regions and learnings that can happen. Um, and then also um, our, our model of Meta and what it is and how we can create that same environment in two very different locations. Um, we wanted to test it out, test it if it was something that could scale across Asia, Middle East and Africa. Um, and I think some of the biggest learnings has been um, in the way people engage. So in Nairobi, um, it's not so much about the space and people kind of bumping into each other there. It's very much around the events and the, the output from the events, the opinions, the ideas that come from them um, just uh, are phenomenal. The creativity is just amazing. Um, like what our events in Hong Kong, 
you kind of people aren't as outspoken they're not mm. uh, as free spirited about their opinions um, and then the corporate environment there is also very different again a lot of them are actually managed from uh, the Middle East mm -hmm. um, and so the their their ability to be able to invest in startups and work with startups is, is harder for them to do mm -hmm. um, but then there's a lot of interesting initiatives from the likes of World Bank and mm -hmm. you know what we did with them was they wanted to change the mindset of a lot of the businesses in Nairobi um, so what we pretty much agreed to do for them was to give them the playbook of how to interact with startups and corporates um, and because we believe that if we can create that environment more there, mm -hmm. that it'll be for the benefit of everybody in, in the region. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so we, we work very differently in, mm. in, in the regions, but it's fun. Mm. And what markets are, are hot in Kenya right now? So I know, you know, sustainability, they're quite well known actually for um, different kind of green initiatives. What's, is it the same sectors that you're looking at there or is it different? Um, it's like some around financial inclusion and, and all of that is similar to what we, we see a lot of need for in uh, Southeast Asia as okay. well. Um, ag tech uh, and food tech as well is something that uh, is also big there. But again, Thailand is also, mm. that's, a, that's a major focus of theirs. So yeah, there's some similarities, but. Okay, cool. And tell us a little bit about what you're going to talk about on Friday. Oh, just a that. tiny bit. <laughs> um, I guess what well, I got to meet with Anna D when she came out to Hong Kong uh, earlier this year and brought her to Meta and showed her around. Um, but then she started asking me a number of questions about my journey and how I've ended up where I am. Um, and so she, what she wanted me to look at was thinking outside the, the traditional way of developing your career and, and where you're going. Um, and so I've, well, I'm, I'm looking a lot at uh, kind of the attitude I've taken to the, to the decisions I've made throughout my, my career mm -hmm. and, and the opportunities they've opened up. Great, okay. And if you were to give some advice on, on anyone in this room on approaching China as a market, uh, for instance, or, or Hong Kong, what, would, what kind of research would you do in advance or what kind of attitude people have to have before they kind of even go over there? Um, I think the biggest thing is attitude actually and I think it's uh, not to assume anything. You, you, you've, you've heard things, you've heard stories of other people are out there but you really need to go there and meet with people and listen. Okay, so many people arrive there and like, I've got the thing that's going to solve all your problems. Listen to me, take my product, you need it. And it just doesn't work. You need such a collaborative approach over there. Um, and relationship, again, is, is, is such a key part of it. Um, and another thing I'd say is if you are looking at Asia, the opportunities are massive and, and, the, and the consumers are very open to innovation. Um, but you need to be ready to scale. Every market there is so different. You can't just, I can do Asia from Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'll, I'll be fine. You need to spend time in each market and your product will probably need to be adapted to each market that you're working in. Um, and you really got to understand the nuances there. Yeah, and sometimes we can be a little bit ignorant about that. I remember when I was uh, based in Hong Kong and it was my first time going to Indonesia. And I couldn't believe it was the third biggest country in the world in terms of population. I knew nothing about it other than a few people went to Bali on holidays, you know, so it's amazing what even a, a Google search for, you know, half an hour and you're like, oh God, you know, Ireland is so small. <laughs> yeah, it, we, we really are. Um, and I, I have to say, uh, I think uh, you're dead right. You need to be there. You know, you can't just kind of half commit to, to any kind of market. You have to have your skin in the game. Remember you said, you know, Liam Casey would get on a plane. He literally lives there and you know, his business is there. So it, it's so important. Um, any kind of, so I'm thinking back to you setting up your own business, um, not to kind of go back to that again and talk about the heartache behind it, but is there anything you would have done differently or would you go there again? Would you do something different? Um, I think no, I'd definitely go there again, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, well, knowing what I'd known at that time, mm -hmm. and I, I, I still, I'd still do it. I think one of my biggest things was actually um, 
having uh, the right Chinese partner involved in it as well. Um, especially with, I made, I've been living there for six years and I still made assumptions about how well I knew the market and how I could um, uh, market and sell to the, to the, to the, to the region. Um, and so the biggest thing I, I would do is, is either have one uh, a partner, a founder on board with me doing that. And also doing it by yourself is also a big challenge because you just don't sleep. You just have it going through your brain every single second of the day. Um, and so having someone that's there with you that you can bounce things off um, makes it such a difference. Okay. And any, would you do wine again or would you do something else? Oh, <laughs> Are you still mad about wine? Well, you live in New Zealand yeah, now, right? Anyway, so I've got a lot of wine to... living in New Zealand now. Um, uh, no, I don't know if I would do wine again. Um, I'm not sure what I would do. It's a good question. Okay. Um, so this is kind of the part where we wrap up our chat and I'll open the floor to, to questions. Um, we have a mic. It's a very relaxed, open environment. Um, so who is a brave person that would like to kick us off? Okay, I'll come down to you. Thank you very much for that talk, it was really, really good. I'm glad about that. Um, I have a good friend who works, or still works in PCH, and I used to love listening to her talk about Liam Casey. She always talked about just him being the consummate entrepreneur and like nobody she'd ever met or heard of. So it'd be fascinating to hear uh, about your take on it as well and what it's like to work for it. Uh, yeah, that's a pretty good summary of what it's like. I think one of the best ways of describing working with someone like Liam Casey is after you come out from a meeting with him, your brain is just absolutely frazzled. He has like jumped five years ahead, seen connected dots that you didn't even knew existed and was asking you, so how are you going to do it? And um, yeah, so I think it's, it's, that, it's that vision and that uh, ability to um, visualize and that confidence of knowing where you're going um, that uh, yeah very very impressive person to work with thank you thanks mark for asking the first question and um, mark has a really cool podcast called grad life media everyone should check it out <laughs> go and speak to him after anyone else like to ask a question anybody Don't be shy. <laughs> Hi, I'm Savi. Uh, my question, how big was language or barrier entering into the Chinese market? Um, well, so I was, uh, I'd been in China for six years, and, um, but I'd only ever really needed, you know, uh, Chinese to get around and, and dinner and stuff like that. So when I was setting up my own business, I knew I needed to, to, to bring my Chinese up to speed. Um, uh, but one thing was, I, I, I'd done a number of lessons in Chinese and tried it a few different times and it just, it hadn't clicked for me. So I sat down with my Chinese teacher and I was like, right, this time it's got to work. Like, I, I'm not doing it. And she started with the, okay, say your name, where are you from? And I was like, look, I don't have time for this. I'm starting a wine business. I know I don't need to know how to talk wine, Chinese, make wine in Chinese <laughs> tomorrow. So anyway, the next day I turned up to class with like five bucks on wine and hand them over to my teacher and I was like, okay, if we're going to, we're going to do this, but let's talk wine in our Chinese class rather than anything else. And she was phenomenal, Grace, so she was up for it. And she now goes to wine tastings and a lot. She ended up being my translator for the website. She helped me do my online wine videos in Chinese and everything like that. Um, and, and yeah, I got to a stage where I was able to, to present to a room about wine in Chinese. So um, yeah, but I needed that push to get there. Um, but doing business in general in, in China, um, it was actually something that I got told at one stage that the thing, if, if, if languages aren't your thing, or you're, you just you don't have the time, it, it, that's okay. You can find some really good people that can help you along the way. And sometimes it can play as a strength because instead of focusing on, am I saying the right thing? Is it coming across right? You can actually read the people in the room and be more engaged mm. in many ways than if you were trying to 
get across what you wanted to in Chinese. But mm. I think it, it, you play to your strengths. I think if, it, mm. if language is, you're good at it, and you can do it, then um, it, it's definitely beneficial, but don't let it be an inhibitor either. Mm. I think you learn so much from body language, and I didn't have Chinese, and I would know when people were talking about me or about the company in the room, and it was really frustrating sometimes, like, what are they saying? I know it's negative, but I don't, you know, and then they'd turn around and it would be all positive. Like, I just missed a really important ingredient there. Yeah. So I would say if you have the time and if you can be that specific about the subject, I love that, that you're just like, teach me about wine and, you know, nothing else. And then I'll be able to kind of, you know, wing it, basically. Yeah, no, it works. It was good. <laughs> Do you use that knowledge at all now? Uh, well, my wine knowledge I use, my Chinese, not so much these days. <laughs> It's an amazing skill to have, though. Anyone else like to ask a question? Oh, hey. There you go. If you don't mind just passing it over then. Yeah, after. of course. Thanks. So the, uh, the tech world tends to be quite diverse and open and progressive. I'm just wondering how you enter a market like Nairobi, like Nairobi within that sort of circumstance where it's perhaps not so transparent, there's a lot of corruption, mm -hmm. and things aren't quite so forward-looking. Does that sort of compromise your integrity? Yeah, no, well, and, and again, it, it comes back to the same thing. It's, a, it's about finding the right partner that you're working with. And, um, you know, we, we've got a really great partner that we work with there in, in helping us set up the space and then in, in hiring some of the first people we got there. And from the day we started there, we have two of the team are, are still there and they're the ones that, um, you know, you've got to trust. Like when you have satellite offices like that, you have to have the trust. Like I'm doing calls two or three times a week with Nairobi, with that team, but I've got to trust that they are running it the way, uh, um, the, the, with the Nest and MetaBrand 100% to the forefront. And you know, we, like China is somewhere we want to be uh, as Nest and Meta, but again, until we find that right partner, we, we, there's no point in rushing into it because you'll just end up losing so much and be, yeah, disaster. Mm -hmm. Hello. Um, you mentioned the, the time you spent in China and then Nairobi. Of the two markets, if you were starting out today, which of those markets would you be more uh, interested in, in maybe pursuing? Would it still be uh, in China or would you be looking at places in Africa? Ah, that's, that's a tough one. So I'd like to be everywhere, if possible. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, uh, now, like, I think what's what's going to be happening in Africa and that I think you know to me I, I, I guess from my perspective now I've been in Asia for so long I'd be so excited to get to spend more time in Africa and, and, and to work there and and see as, as, it, as, as everything evolves there so I I can't pick between the two to be honest I'm kind of I'm, uh, yeah, I'm a lover at all <laughs> thank you thank you uh, my question is, uh, basically in China I noticed that it's very important to have uh, the Guanxi in order to do business, which is a concept that means network and there's a little bit more to it. How would you recommend to, to start to have a Guanxi in China? Sure. Yeah, well, so Guanxi, like, relationship is, is all built on trust. So, um, it's all about spending that time there. Like, if you think about it here in Dublin, you already have your network and so and you've got your friend who'll connect you into so and so at whatever bank that you want to get into so you already have that currency of trust and relationship um, and so it still exists here that same guanxi concept it just you live here so you're you, it's it happens quicker um, so in somewhere like china you just really got to take the time and spend the time there but you also have to be willing to put skin in the game as well you know, um, one, of, one of the stories, and again, coming back to Liam, but from where he set up, one of his first shipments he was shipping out of China, he gave his passport to the, to the factory owner and was like, okay, look, I trust you, you trust me, let's do this deal, and then, and everybody will get paid. And, you know, you, you've got to show that trust. You, it's not a one-way thing, and I think that's what happens quite often is that, you know, people spend a bit of time there and kind of feel like, Okay, now they should trust me, but you need to go that extra mile. Mm -hmm. Hello, um, I'm Tatiana. I, I, I've been listening to you and um, I have a question about 
What would you say is the skill set that's made you successful, basically working with the startups and working with the corporates and building the businesses? And <laughs> I mean, I'm thinking along the lines of you know you have salespeople and relationship people and analytical people. And what would you say is what you what what's made you successful? Um, I think it's my curiosity. So um, always asking questions but like I'm interested I'm not just asking questions for the sake of it like I really want to know and understand people's businesses and what are the driving factors of them and then I also think what's been key as well has been a, that I know that you, we can do so much more as a team rather than as an individual so that, that collaboration element to it as well um, yeah I think my team sports growing up I think helped me a lot in that as well but um, Combining those two together, there's just so much opportunity that can that can come out of it. Uh, what advice would you give for creating a partnership? What are you looking for? Um, I think um, that's a good one. Um, I was going to come with the answer of it's a gut feel, which I know doesn't really answer your question, but you need to be on the same wavelength and you need to understand each other. Um, again, it's got to be equal. So um, I think a lot of, you know, I see, I, what I hate to see is like trying to force a square into a round hole type things like, oh, these two should work together. But really, actually, their values are different. What they're looking to achieve is not aligned with what that startup wants to do, and it's going to take them on the wrong path and end up developing their product in a way that's not where their vision wants to go. So, you know, I, I see some partnership opportunities, and at times I'm like, actually, take a step back. Is this really where you want to go? And um, are they on the same page as you? So, and but a lot of what it comes down to is showing up, meeting with people, interacting with people, and asking questions, and you'll you'll feel it. You'll see those opportunities, and you know it's not always going to work out. But um, if you are uh, have the same values and have the same vision, then it it will come together. Any other questions? Another one. I'll go with that. I'll go with that. Hmm? I'll go with that. Okay, um, yeah, thank you. Sorry, uh, another question was, I'm wondering how welcome you think Western business and Western ambition is in China, foreign Western, you know, like, is, would they really try to make an effort to work with Chinese businesses ahead of you work? So, this, I have had the most amazing experience in, in, in doing business in China and being there, don't get me wrong, I've had my, I've had my down times too, but in general, I've always felt very welcome and very open to doing business. Um, again, if your business is the best at what you're doing and you can bring a value that no one else can, it's just like anywhere else. They'll want to do business with you rather than with somebody else. Um, but again, if it's relationship based as well, though, so you know you've got to spend the time. I've said it. I don't know how many times now, mm. but. Um, they, they're definitely open to doing business with foreigners, um, but you've got to prove that you're, you're, you're the right fit and that, that you're trustworthy. Mm. And there's a lot of Chinese companies now coming over and investing in Europe as well, so, you know, kind of moving the other way as well. Any other questions? Some really good questions. Do you like? Go here first. I'm just wondering on your, your global search for startups as Ireland's ever popped up, or is there something that would discount? Oh, no, no, definitely. Uh, it, everywhere it, 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 it pops up at times. We get applications from, from Ireland. We do, we do look. And even from a meta perspective, you know, we, we've worked actually with the, um, the Irish Consul General in Hong Kong, looking at ways that we can help bring batches of Hong Irish startups over to Hong Kong to get to do an initial understanding of what's happening there and everything like that. So um, we actually, one of the startups we just invested in has an Irish founder, uh, Patrick Lynch, with uh, First Circle, although based in the mm -hmm. Philippines now. Um, yeah, so you know, Irish startups definitely come our way. You've 
want to ask a question, so I'm just going to do a follow-up question if you don't mind, because that's, that's really good. One. Can you talk a little bit about what you've learned about risk and how the risk act has changed between the different cultures and, mm. and what you've learned and what we as the Irish ecosystem can learn from, mm. from, from that mm. different risk act? You mean from a entrepreneur, entrepreneur an, perspective, yeah. And and what entrepreneurs in Asia, what their risk appetite is, or people working with entrepreneurs in Asia? So the Asian entrepreneurs, what, what their risk appetite is like, and what how's it different to the Nairobi to, to, to Finland, and then what we can learn from that here? Um, so it, it's interesting because a lot of Asia even has the culture of you know you don't want to fail, and and your your parents are are quite can be quite controlling in in, in what role you can take um, and so it's taken quite a lot for some entrepreneurship to be able to come out they're kind of hidden away in little gems in certain areas but then the technologies and the what they go after i think they're more comfortable to go outside their comfort zone than than some of what we see in europe i think as well um, again i don't know if i would really differentiate between entrepreneurs that much around the world either you know everyone some people when they've got their vision and, and, and they're going after it mm. you know similar to Irish entrepreneurs they're not going to let anyone stand in their way um, yeah well, just to follow up on that so what about the ecosystem then like in, in terms of okay. the, the venture space government initiatives is there anything that we could be doing different here um, yeah well there's definitely a lot of government incentives and a lot of the big uh, VCs are mainly, if you're coming to Asia and you're looking to raise a uh, Series A and that Singapore is the place to go, um, that's where you're going to find the majority of the money and they're definitely willing to go after some uh, game changing technologies. But somewhere like Hong Kong, they're definitely not as tech savvy and they're more risk averse. Um, Honestly, actually, I don't want to speak too much to the Irish uh, because I just literally haven't been here. Um, maybe you can add to it, I guess. Um, yeah, I, I have heard over the past few days that obviously th there's quite a lot of funding here, but whether the technologies that it's going into is, 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 are the right ones, but yeah. <laughs> I had a question that I thought was similar to his, but actually it's not. <laughs> so, uh, I wanted to ask you, given that you follow like startups that are scaling, you said a lot of beautiful things about doing so. I wanted just to know what are the biggest mistakes that they do? Mm -hmm. How to avoid them? Mm -hmm. um, I think the biggest one I've seen is underestimating what it takes to especially scaling to new markets, right? Everyone does out their plan, in six months we're going to have, even, even the amount of people you'll have hired on the ground in six months to then build your, we'll have X amount of sales within 12 months and Y amount of partners. Um, before someone's even really even gone to the market and met with people there and understood how things work there. So I think, Again, it's that not making assumptions. You go and explore, meet with people, go talk to other entrepreneurs who've gone there before and seen what they've done. You, you know, people for some reason kind of want to just trailblaze by themselves, like, I'm going to be the one that's going to take on Indonesia. And it's like, there's been a lot of people that have gone before you and there's been a lot of mistakes made already. Go and learn from them um, and don't assume that you know that your product's going to just rock in that market. Um, yeah, and, and, and again, the timeline, it's, it's even the same for hardware startups that I've worked with. Everyone assumed that they could get from prototype to consumers in six months. It, it takes longer than that. If, if you don't know what the process is, ask somebody. Mm -hmm. I just want to say thanks so much to Neve for, for giving her time. It's amazing to have someone with your level of, of knowledge on you know, markets on the other side of the world and just kind of opening up our, our mindsets and being curious and, and getting to know about different markets so thank you so much i'd love to just kind of finish it finish everything by asking what are you most proud of when you look back obviously you still have a very you know long career ahead of you but i just always like to kind of reflect and and ask you what has your biggest achievement been um i, I think it's that i've 
just constantly kept doing something new and kept challenging myself. I think if I was to look back and said, oh, I sat in that job there for, for three or four years, it was grand, I was able to cruise, I'd be disappointed in myself. Um, I don't think you'd ever do that. <laughs> it doesn't sound like you're, you cruise along. Um, yeah, no, I think, uh, no, I'm not very good at cruising. Yeah. But, um, yeah, no, I'm just I'm just proud that I I've taken the, the I don't want to call them risks. I've kind of I've gone on these unknown journeys, not knowing where it's going to end up. I've no idea what I might be doing in New Zealand in, in two years' time, and, and, and that's okay. Um, being okay with the unknown, I guess, is mm. what I'm, I didn't realize it had it in me to be yeah. honest when I was in school and university, but it kind of happened. Yeah. Okay. So I think we can all take that away. So be okay with the unknown. Stay curious, ask lots of questions, genuine questions. Um, thank you so much, Neve. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody.